On Thursday, February 24th, 2022, Vladimir Putin ordered the Russian army to invade Ukraine. Jeffrey Simpson, renowned journalist, one with a lifelong interest in Russia and the former European correspondent, says it was a combination of irredentism, great Russian chauvinism, and authoritarian rule in play, and they have forced us to recast our thinking forced us to reshape our perception of the post-Cold War era. An era that saw the spread of liberal democratic policies push east through Europe to the western borders of Russia. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO has accepted membership from a unified Germany, Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Turkey, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Then in 2005, talks began with Ukraine to join NATO. Well, that has not happened. Many other countries that encircle the Russian Western Front have joined the alliance. Putin has had enough, and last Thursday he shot back by attacking Ukraine. The attack exposed a myriad of geopolitical and international trade issues that are unraveling as the Russian army continues to advance. I invited Jeffrey Simpson to join me for a conversation that matters about what Russia's invasion is about and what it will mean to the world and Canada. Jeffrey, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. These are truly troubling times right now. What we're watching happen, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's hard to really comprehend. From your perspective, what do you really believe is Putin's motivation? Well, I, I, let me go back to those three pressures that I mentioned. Irredentism is the desire to capture territory that a certain entity thinks it lost, probably unfairly, and it wants to get it back. So there's an element of irredentism, the notion that Ukraine was drifting towards the West. It wanted to become a member of the European Union. It wanted NATO membership, and uh, it was drifting away from what he considered to be Russia's orbit of influence. And after all, there are a large number of Russian speakers in Ukraine. Great Russian chauvinism in the sense that um, the Russians are extremely proud and they have always considered themselves to be a major power in Europe and particularly in recent decades in the world. But they found themselves after the collapse of the Soviet Union in a very, very weakened state, which was psychologically debilitating for some people who were prominent in or who were committed to the previous Soviet Union, of which Putin was one. I don't think Putin has any illusions about going back to a communist system of uh, running the economy, but he has a very strong authoritarian streak in him, as most Russian leaders have going back into Tsarist times and then through Bolshevik times, and now he's the recon of that. And when you have an authoritarian regime, which has become more and more authoritarian as he has squeezed out almost all of the political opponents and thrown them in jail or they're in exile. The media is now down to just one or two dissident voices. Uh, so it's very difficult for us in the West to understand the messages that the Russian people are getting in an authoritarian regime, which are all controlled by the state or almost all controlled by the state. And when you're in an authoritarian regime domestically, uh, you don't like democratic regimes around you. You actually fear. There's a kind of internal fear of chaos in Russia. It's a funny thing. Um, Russia's been a powerful country for a long period of time, but it has been invaded three times in the last 200 years by Napoleon and then twice by uh, Germans. So there's an innate uh, sense of fragility which is compensated for sometimes by an overly aggressive posture uh, to ward off uh, would-be attackers or would-be enemies. And there's also been a strange dichotomy in Russia, Russia going way back, which is there's always a sliver or a group of people, notably in Moscow and St. Petersburg, who are very Western-oriented, who look to, they used to look to France, they used to look to Germany, they used to look to England as a model for what they wanted Russia to become. But the great mass of Russians never saw that. They were Slavophiles. They were Russian patriots. They didn't want to emulate the French or the British. And that's kind of what you've had in the last number of years, where you have a certain number of dissidents in Russia who would like Russia to become 
what we would consider to be a normal democratic country. And there was evidence that Russia might have been moving in that direction. But there was also this very strong view that that leads to chaos. The Russians have always, it's almost like they've never trusted themselves. And so they've wanted an authoritarian or a strong ruler to make sure that things didn't start unraveling in that vast country. And Putin came out of the security services, the KGB. Many of the people who are in senior positions now in Russia are former KGB or security people. They're not Democrats. They're not people who got elected. And so this is the way he's kind of sees how Russia should be governed. And what he particularly didn't like, I think, was two things. One is the massive street demonstrations in Belarus, which were put down by Lukashenko, and the 19, sorry, the 2014 sort of revolution almost in Ukraine with the big demonstrations and then the free elections that brought these people to power who are there now. This is not uh, something that he wants as a great Russian chauvinist to be a kind of contagion that might spread across the border into Russia. You know, as I watched him posturing leading up to the invasion, it looked to me that it was really uh, positioning and that he was flexing his muscles and that had he not invaded, I felt that he had a better chance of being able to negotiate with the Ukrainians and maybe even NATO uh, at a, on a larger scale to get what he wanted. But the moment that he pulled the trigger, it's as though the air went completely out of that option. And he seems to have done for NATO what no past president has been able to do for three or four administrations. Has he miscalculated? Well, it depends on what you think his ultimate objective was. If his ultimate objective was to make sure that Ukraine did not fall in whole or in part into the orbit of Western Europe, and also he really thinks the United States is behind a lot of this, then you have to occupy the territory because Ukraine was moving in that direction after 1914, it's like 1914, after 2014. Uh, they had asked for membership, as you mentioned, in NATO. They hadn't received the positive response, but they hadn't received a negative one either. They had said they wanted to become a member of the European Union. So he could see that Ukraine was moving in a direction away from what he as a great Russian chauvinist would have considered its true vocation. You know, the speech he gave, the hour long speech in which he went through a kind of historical recitation as he saw it of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia was very revealing because his view was that Russia and Ukraine have essentially always been the same. I mean, they're like close cousins, if I can put it that way. They're family. And the West was conspiring to move a member of this family away from Mother Russia, Holy Russia, with security implications that would be negative, i.e., if they join NATO, they might put forces into Ukraine right on the border of Belarus and Russia. So he saw this as something that had to be stopped. Now, could it have been stopped by diplomacy? He obviously didn't think so. And if we rewind the reel, and it's always easy to be wise after the fact, right? <laughs> I mean, when you start moving troops to the Ukrainian border from as far away as Siberia, this isn't like the Duke of York who marched his men up the hill and marched them down again. You've, you've moved them thousands and thousands of kilometers. You've put an enormous, it was estimated up to 200,000 soldiers on the border encircling, plus ships in the Black Sea. Plus, presumably, they've got internal agents that they were activating in Ukraine. Um, and um, I think he went through a pantomime of talking to European leaders in the couple of weeks beforehand to make it kind of look like he was interested in some kind of an arrangement. But he really always had this very much in mind. And I think the speeches that he gave to the Russian people just before this, which we all read with great interest, indicate that he really had this in mind for some time. Now, has he miscalculated in two ways? One, will the resistance in Ukraine be sufficient to produce a number of casualties on the Russian side, to slow down the advance, such that the military uh, battles linger for much longer than he thought. Secondly, I'm surprised, <laughs> frankly, at the speed with which the Europeans have come together 
on a range of fronts because the European Union often takes a long time to reach a decision. But in this case, they reached a series of economic decisions uh, and political decisions within a matter of a day or two. And I'll tell you one thing that is, of all the things that have happened in Europe, the most stunning to me is the complete change of approach by the Germans, who after all are the most important state in the European Union. And for the longest time under Angela Merkel and this new coalition government, the argument was, we're going to talk to the Russians. We do a lot of business with the Russians. We've known the Russians through the centuries. Uh, we can talk to them. We can mitigate whatever negative things they might do. And secondly, we don't, because of our history, we don't militarily intervene anywhere. Okay. The French can do that. The British can do that. The American, but we don't. And within 48 hours, three things happen. One is they canceled the pipeline that was going to bring natural gas from Russia to Germany. That will be a cost to Russia, but it'll be a cost to Germany too. Secondly, and amazingly, they said, we're going to increase our defense budget by a hundred billion dollars. And we're going to achieve the NATO target of 2%, which they've never reached and which we in Canada are far from. That's a huge change, right? That's a, that's a, and thirdly, the, I said, non-governmental parts of German society have almost overnight reached a consensus that, look, talk is, talk is useless now. We have to take serious measures. So uh, that, that for the pivot country in Europe, which is Germany, is a huge change. So do you think that the collective response from uh, the sanctions that are now being imposed on Russia, the move in the last couple of days to remove them from the SWIFT payment system, albeit except for energy, um, is going to have an effect on uh, Russia in maybe a little bit in the short term, but in the long term, the price that they may wind up paying for this could be incredibly severe and the impact will be felt by the average Russian in a way that they haven't in decades. Well, you, you said the key phrase, which is the average Russian. Um, the average Russian gets its in his or her information from the television and radio media totally controlled by the state. Yes, I think there's one independent small television station left, but they're going to get a steady diet hour by hour, day by day, week by week of propaganda that we had to do this because the West was threatening us. They were going to put nuclear weapons, uh, all kinds of the genocide that went on. And the, the thing about an authoritarian, authoritarian regime is that you can systematically lie and, and get away with it for quite a long period of time. So the average Russian, um, not the people who are in the sophisticated shops of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but, you know, the folks in Novosibirsk and Pirm and all over that vast country, that's the, inform that's the information source that they have. I would also say from a historical point of view, the Russians have always felt or frequently felt that other countries look down on them and are conspiring against them. That, that's a, that runs very, very deep in Russian history. So Putin will play to that and say, you know, the West made us do this because they were separating us from our Ukrainian cousins. They were going to station troops and NATO equipment in uh, Russia, in Ukraine rather, because they wanted to threaten Russia. You know, this is deep in the Russian psychiatry, psychology. And so I think that Putin knows that. So to what extent does the average Russian have the capacity to overturn Putin? My own view is that if Putin were ever to be forced to leave, it would be because of an internal palace coup, not because, not because the, the people rose up. Because as we saw the first demonstrations, you see how the regime reacts. It chucks most of the people in jail or in prison for a period of time. And there are no, uh, no opposition leaders of any note. The only one in Novotny is in a jail and will be there for a while. So an internal palace revolt caused by people who see that this gambit has failed and has had costs, economic costs and reputational costs for, for Russia. Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, it, it's, it's, 
it's not a country that turns its leaders over easily because it's so authoritarian, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that has been revealed to, I think, average Americans and North Americans is how dependent the United States and Canada are on Russian oil. Uh, and, you know, there, there is going to be a consequence here. It's going to affect uh, lifestyles here. It's going to uh, put uh, a stress test on how we've managed our own resources in North America. You know, I, is, with respect, is, is, we're, not, we're, we're not dependent on Russia for oil. The Americans are oil exporters. They're not importers, and we right. are big exporters, too. So, no, that, we're, we're not. It's Europe that's going to face the pinch because the backdrop to this, and here Putin may have miscalculated, I'm not sure. In the months preceding this invasion, the Europeans, and I draw attention in particular to the Germans, were having a very tough very, very high energy prices. It had been a cold winter. The Germans made a decision that I think was very, very foolish. After the Fukushima nuclear reactor uh, catastrophe in Japan, Angela Merkel dis announced that she was going to phase out quickly the German nuclear reactors. Uh, and the, the, the plan had always been to phase them out at the end of their natural life. But she said, no, we're going to close them soon. And when that's what they've been doing. Well, that, you know, they said we can we can make and we're going to shut the coal mines down. And the argument was we can we can fill in the gap caused by these two decisions by ramping up wind and solar. Bringing in gas from Russia. Now, what happened, they found out, is that no matter how fast they were trying to build turbines and, and, uh, and uh, solar panels, they couldn't generate enough, nearly enough electricity. And now they've cut off the pipeline from Russia in defiance of the Russian decision to invade Ukraine. So they've got a vulnerability on the energy side. The Americans are shipping more liquefied natural gas to uh, Germany to try to fill in some of the gap, but they are now more vulnerable. And, and that's why it's interesting that the Germans took the decision they did because it's they who are going to pay a certain price for this in terms of higher energy uh, costs and other European countries too. Italy, for example, was going to get about a lot of that gas from the pipeline from Russia. But even they've come along and said, no, we got to take a strong stance against the Russians. So Putin has done something that is pretty remarkable. He seems to have united all the European countries, even, even his friend in Hungary, Orban, who went to see him a few weeks before this, has pretty much shut up. And he's the authoritarian, well, not authoritarian, but he's the very right wing anti-immigrant pro-Russian president of, of Hungary. And even he's had to go to ground. Do you believe that in Beijing they're watching what is unfolding yeah. here? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like very of course, closely. there's lots of sure. Well, a whole bunch of reasons. One is go back to energy. Um, they have a number of agreements with Russia for Russian energy to go to China, and they will want probably to to have even more. And the Russians may want to divert uh, in due course more energy there. Secondly, just before, just before the invasion, you may remember Mr. Putin went to China at a meeting with the Chinese leader, pronounced themselves best of friends. Um, and all of a sudden your best friend or one of your best friends goes and invades another country, but your policy as the Chinese is borders are inviolate. Oh, they are? Well, suddenly your best friend declared that they weren't. So the Chinese are talking out of both sides of their mouth on this, saying that the NATO buildup was necessary and created security problems for the Russians. But, you know, we hope there can be a peaceful resolution. I mean, it's all they're they're between the devil and the deep blue sea on this. But what everybody's really worried about is if the Russians could pull this off um, reasonably quickly, recover from the negative economic consequences, um, that this might embolden the Chinese to make a move on Taiwan. Because they've said at some point they're going to bring Taiwan back into Mother China. 
So I think that the Chinese are watching very carefully world reaction. They're looking at the web, the tools that the uh, countries are using against Russia economically. Now, China is much more powerful economically than Russia. There's no question about that. So these tools that are being used against Russia are not necessarily ones that would be successful against China. But no, I'm sure the Chinese are looking at this and in their own calculating way are saying, what lessons can we derive from this experience guiding us in terms of our ambitions for Taiwan? So in Canada, from a humanitarian perspective, of course, uh, we have great concern for millions of people in, U in Ukraine, and, and, and we know that there is a very strong bond between uh, a large Ukrainian uh, uh, population uh, in Canada. What else does this invasion of the Ukraine mean to us in Canada? Let me just dwell for a moment on that first one. We have 1.3 million people of Ukrainian descent in Canada. It could go back, you know, back into the 19th century, some of this. <laughs> I was joking with a friend from Manitoba the other day. I said, you know, you better get ready to receive a number of Ukrainians. I said, they may be the only refugees in the world you could think of who wouldn't find the Canadian winter that different from what they have at home. I mean, you know, somebody comes from Vietnam or Syria or Afghanistan or most places on our beloved earth and they get our winter and they say, get me home, get me anywhere here. But the Ukrainians would, you know, anyway. So we, we will have to have, I think, all, all hands aboard for a very massive influx of, uh, of, of Ukrainians because we are the third largest country in the world in terms of the population of people of Ukrainian descent. So this is going to be a multi, multi-month effort to bring and settle and resettle people. But I think the second question for Canada is this, and I don't know the answer to it. Over a long period of time, Canadians have been largely disinterested in defense questions. And governments have seen that as a result, our defense budget within NATO is one of the very lowest. Prime ministers, I used to say about Stephen Harper that he liked the idea of the military, he just didn't like the military, by which I meant the military keeps throwing up problems, i.e. contracts that are way over budget, don't get built on time. Sexual harassment, that seems to be what this government's interested in in the military more than anything else. But the notion of actually having a robust, well-equipped military is nominally accepted by Canadian governments, but it's not actually put into practice. I mean, just to do a little side comment, this particular liberal government came into office promising that they were going to have a new fighter aircraft and they were going to open up a competition and that they were going to go forward. They were not going to choose the Lockheed aircraft. Well, how many years have they now been in office? Then they have, they're have they down to two, right? They're still a long way, I think, maybe a matter of six months, maybe five years, I don't know, for making a decision. They don't want to make a decision, right? They're just not interested in defense. And a whole series of ministers of defense in both governments, conservative and liberal, have been appointed without any military background. And they get no support from their colleagues around the cabinet table. I've talked to, I don't know how many ministers of defense over my career. And I said, well, what's it like in the cabinet? Do you discuss geopolitical issues? Do you just go, no, no, no. The only thing the cabinet's interested in is if we're gonna purchase something, where are the jobs gonna go? How are we gonna redistribute the jobs? So, so and, the, and the feeling was Europe's kind of far away. We withdrew our forces from Germany a long time ago. Yes, we've sent a few forces to Latvia in the last X number of months. Will this focus Canadians' attention on the fact that the world is now a much more precarious place than we thought it was? And in the age of hypersonic missiles and all kinds of new, and cybersecurity, we're not as invulnerable as we thought. So will it allow political actors the space to talk seriously, provided they can, about defense issues? Or will this continue to be a political no-go zone where there's a lot of airy talk and very little action? I don't know. For example, it'll be very interested to see the attitude of the New Democratic Party, which has always leaned towards pacifism, doesn't like much military spending, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the government that did what I just described in Germany is led by a social democratic chancellor. 
in a coalition with the Greens, because the foreign minister of Germany now is a Green and the chancellor is an SDP. And so will our new Democrats take their usual quasi pacifist position or will they actually say, you know, the world has changed and it's a much less stable place than we thought it was. And maybe we should uh, be more supportive of the military. I, I don't know. It'll be an interesting, it'll be an interesting thing to watch in Canada over the next number of months to see whether your mythical average Canadian now says, mm, yeah, because this government, if you look at its priorities, it's all on the social spending side. Right. Well, at the risk of sounding a little bit glib, we have to remind ourselves that Russia is a neighbor of Canada as well yes, uh, yes. through the north. And Putin does not accept our claim to uh, ownership of many of the areas uh, in, in the far north. So I'm glad you mentioned that, because if you said if you asked me and who am I just an observer, OK, we're a member of the NATO alliance. Where can we make a, a serious contribution? What, what could we do? Well, I think it was two things we could do. One is that there will be certainly the repositioning of forces in the contiguous states to the Soviet Union. We've had some troops in Latvia. We may have to go back to a period where we're positioning troops in Poland or the Baltic countries or something like that. But secondly, the Arctic, okay? We, we don't think of the Arctic as a place of some kind of military conflict. But in fact, um, the Chinese are there they are very interested in what's going on in the Arctic. The Russians have built up a very substantial underwater capacity because they have an even larger share of the Arctic than we do. And we have not got icebreakers that can go through uh, the heavy ice up there. Uh, we barely have, we've got frigates that we're building, but I mean, we, 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 could, we could really say to ourselves, okay, we're going to take a leading, a leading role, a serious role in the Arctic. We're not just going to claim territory. No, no, we're going to, we're going to build the equipment and we're going to build the bases that we need up there. And NATO would be extremely happy if we did that. But do we have the, the are we willing to spend the money? Are we willing to do the analysis? So far, I think the answer is no, but maybe this will change our attitudes. I'm not preaching for this, okay? I'm not preaching for this. But many years ago, when Brian Mulroney was the prime minister and Perrin Beattie was the minister of defense, Beattie floated the idea of building nuclear-powered submarines. And I, myself, said at the time, um, they're too expensive and uh, we shouldn't do that. You know, if I had my, if I had to rethink it again, I'd say, hmm. The Australians, as you know, are going in that direction because they mm -hmm. see the threat of China and they're a big island continent. But we have all this territory in the north and you need to operate under the ice to be effective up there. And nuclear submarines will allow you to do that. But of course, they're very expensive. And could you persuade the Canadian public that they should spend money on this instead of, you know, child care, health care, more money for indigenous. I mean, whatever. There's an endless list of social programs which this government is anxious to spend money on. And if you mention something such as I just did, it'd be a tough sell. But maybe, maybe because of what's happening, it wouldn't be as tough as I think. I don't know. Well, to wrap up, to come back to your uh, statement that this is uh, the action in Ukraine is forcing us to refocus our perceptions of the world and our place in it. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but from the end of the Second World War until the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a kind of stability in Europe. The, the continent was divided, to be sure. There were upheavals in Poland and then the Hungarian Revolution and then the Czech, Czechoslovakia as it then was. But there was no sense, you know, when the Hungarian Revolution broke out and Eisenhower was president of the United States, there were voices in, in, in the States that said, you know, we got to go in and send our troops in and help these people who are rebelling against Soviet rule. And Eisenhower, who was a wise man, said no, no. So, so all that period was one of stability. Then the Cold War ended, 
uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and down came the Berlin Wall. And I remember living in the United States at, just after that. And there was this unbelievable sense in the United States, and it was unbelievable, that all of a sudden, the quote unquote enemy that we'd had ever since 1946, if you like, had disintegrated. And the Americans, I was living in California, they were decommissioning military bases and they set up a congressional uh, committee of experts to tell Congress which bases should be decommissioned across the country. And they were canceling certain weapon systems. And it was America triumphalist. We'd won the Cold War and Russia's in retreat. And all these countries that used to be in the Warsaw Pact were clamoring to become members of NATO because they could get out from under the Russian uh, domination. I just, I'm rambling a little bit, but I remember as a correspondent, you mentioned I was a correspondent. I spent time in Poland in the early 1980s in the solidarity movement, right? And I got to speak to a number of people in the senior solidarity movement. And I asked them all, what is your objective? This is 1981, what's your objective for Poland? And they would say, we just want to be a normal country. And I'd say, well, what does normal mean? Well, we want to be a member of the European common market and we'd like to be in NATO. And I said, come on. And why didn't I was polite. I said, excuse me, but that's not going to happen. Well, eight years later, the wall came down and all the things that these people had been dreaming about became possible and they seized them. And we agreed. You can argue historically, maybe we shouldn't have done it, but we did it. So now that period from 1990 to 2022, which again, we thought would produce stability of a different kind, more favorable to us than when Europe was divided. And if you're sitting in Moldova or Latvia, you know, you have to say to yourself, you know, we're small countries and we got a guy with a big appetite. So there's a stability that is not there at the moment. And we don't know how the Ukrainian thing will play itself out, but it has certainly caused a lot of Europeans, including those who, as I said, thought that you could deal with the Russians in a different way to reconsider. A lot of the intellectuals I'm reading in Europe are, are saying, mm, we have to really rethink what we're doing. I'll make a last point. I think one of the reasons why Putin did what he did when he did it was because he saw the disarray in the United States. I mean, one of our biggest challenges, and God knows we're on the front line of this, is the dysfunctional nature of the United States at the moment. And I use that word advisedly. The political divisions here are not just in politics, but they're in school board elections and library board elections and people who don't want to talk to each other and they don't want their kids to marry into the other clan. Uh, the media is terribly divided and politicized. So the capacity of this country to do things domestically now together is seriously circumscribed. And the American political system is increasingly dysfunctional. I think, I think Putin saw all this <coughs> and said, I think I can take advantage of the fact that the United States is, is uh, not capable anymore of coming to consensus decisions. Uh, and now is the time for me to move. And I've got the Chinese back, and I've got the Americans disorganized internally, and uh, the Europeans, you know, will talk, but they won't do much. He's wrong on that. So this is an opportune time. Well, it's a frightening time, especially uh, when we see the, you know, the interconnectedness of, of the world, uh, the ways in which any action affects others, um, how it's going to play out remains to be seen, doesn't it? I just want last one last thing. I think that, and here I'm, I'm, I'm almost contradicting what I said before about the capacity of the Russian people to make a change, but they're a well-educated population. You know, they have high levels of education. And what I am impressed about, and this may get through to them, is when you cancel a bunch of non-governmental things, in other words, they love hockey. So you're sitting in Perm, which was going to be the host of the World Junior Hockey Tournament starting next December, and all of a sudden it's pulled, okay? The orchestras, which 
tour, the great Russian, they'll, they're being disinvited right now. The big soccer match in Europe was going to be played at the end of the European Championships in St. Petersburg, big stadium. It's not going to happen. Whether, you know, all across the board, Russia is being disinvited, if I can put it that way. They're almost being treated, well, they are being treated as a pariah state. And so people who are interested in soccer or hockey or judo or ballet or opera or, or, or you know, it, all of a sudden the gates are closed and some Russians will say, what have we, what, what have we done here? How did we get our, our country in a position where we can't play hockey against these countries anymore? We can't have the Bolshoi ballet go to London. What, you know, what have we done? So I'm not under any illusions that there's going to be an enormous, you know, people's revolution in the streets. But I think those sorts of actions do seep through to ordinary Russians and will cause them to ask themselves questions about what, what is happening. I, I, I hope so. I think so. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate your thoughts and insights into this very complicated and uh, uh, fluid situation in Ukraine. Thanks for having me. Good luck.